Listen, God, let's pray. God, thank you so much for this day, how we honor you, we praise you, we thank you so much that you have allowed us to be in this space, to have life at this time is such a tremendous blessing, and we don't take that for granted. So God, would you now allow us to learn something that would help us to do better what you've called us to do? It's only two of us, the spirit of the living God, that's all you need. You just need us to be available, and would you now guide us and direct us in Jesus' name? Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. So I asked you to, to, to write down a definition for preaching. Um, I don't want to give you a chance to begin our discussion this morning. I have to turn my wife's phone off. She always got her phone on. Um, She's probably looking for a phone right now. I picked it up thinking I was doing a good thing. Then forgot I picked it up. Uh, I picked it up so that I could, so that I could tell her. Why is that not focusing properly? Um, let me see. Hold on one second. The camera is. So, so um, give me, let's begin by hearing what you say. How, what, what is preaching? How do you understand? I say uh, preaching is giving the word of God uh, through his wisdom through uh, his guidance. So giving the word of God through, through, through give God's wisdom. So it's giving, I like that, the word of God. Say it again. Giving the word of God through his wisdom and his guidance. Through his wisdom. It's not a, it's not a more of a human thing as if it's something to talk about. It's more like God came to you about this word and you prayed to him about this this word. While it was correct, while it was right. Okay. So 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 in short, so in short, I don't know why my camera keeps doing that, but my camera keeps um losing focus like it's not um I don't know if it's something on the camera or what, but let me see if I can fix it right quick. And if I can't, then then it cleared back up. I'm wondering. Is something going on on the lens to where it's not clear? I wonder. I wonder. We shall see in just a minute. Maybe it won't do it again. All right. So it's so it's really you saying it's a God activity. Is what you say? What more like a God and human? So you saying now? So so you saying it's a God plus human activity? Okay, so it's God, it's God doing one part and we do another part. That's what I hear you saying, correct? Yes. Okay, okay. And why why do you think why do you think that? Uh, I, I used to think it was just a speech that was given out every Sunday, but as I learned more, it's more as a, you pray on one subject of the word and you come to church with that word that God is approving of or that you deem uh, worthy to give. Because mm -hmm. uh, not everybody's going to learn the same lesson, but God's giving you this lesson in order to get to the next. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so let let me let me say that I like this. Given the word of God through through God's wisdom, you'll understand more as we go along. That I don't. I typically don't use male patriarchal language to describe God. I normally use inclusive language mm -hmm. to describe to describe God. Um, I think there are some dangers to uh, making God he and him mm -hmm. uh, because now God becomes equated with maleness and it, it lends itself toward uh, the abuse of women, the mistreatment of women, um, the downgrading of women and um, and the church the church has a, a great great history of that. When I say a great history of that and I think we have to avoid that at all costs. But I like the beginning of this destination. What I want to do today is I'm going to I'm going to erase this just because I don't have much space. That's the only reason. But I want you to keep that in your mind because I think that's important. Let me give you some definitions of some people um, that have been noted as as incredible um, thinkers in the field of homiletics. Um, now let me let me let me just be clear. Homiletics. You familiar with that term? Homiletics. 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 I'm sorry, I misspelled it. Homiletics. 
homiletics. It, it literally means the preparation, or it's really the art of the preparation and delivery of sermons. So when you talk about when you talk about preaching, and we're saying we're talking about we're in the field of homiletics, we're talking about how do we go about the pro the possibility, the prospects of preparing a sermon to preach. Now, this is important because of what you said homiletic home preaching is that you said that preaching deals with um, you said that preaching deals with both um, what God says and the human aspect. So that there's some kind of partnership related in this. Associated with homiletics is a word, hermeneutics. Let me make sure I spell it correctly. I have a tendency to misspell it. So when you talk about hermeneutics, hermeneutics basically deals with the art of study or another way to say it is you're talking about um, the process of, I'm going to say it differently than what many are going to say, it, the unpacking of scripture. So you, you're talking, when you talk about hermeneutics, you're talking about things like word study and you're talking about a doctrinal approach and you're talking. So when you start talking about hermeneutics, hermeneutics and homiletics go hand in hand. And that's important for us to understand. I want us to begin this morning with some, with, with giving you some definitions of some preachers. This, the definitions that I'm going to give you are found predominantly in several books. Well, let me see. Let me make sure which books I pulled this out of. I believe, yeah, I, pre, I pulled all of these out of one book. The book is called Power in the Pulpit. Power in the Pulpit is volume one. And it's by a guy by the name of Cleo, Dr. Cleophus LaRue. I would encourage you to add that book to your library. It's um, it's going to it's going to ultimately end up being an incredible resource for you. Uh, Dr. Gardner Taylor, who is considered by many to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest, preacher in the in the black pulpit anyway, in the last century. Uh, Dr. Gardner Taylor said the difference between a good preacher and a great preacher is the library. I think Dr. Gardner Taylor is right. The difference, Blake, between those who do it exceptionally well and those who just kind of do it off a gift is what we read, what we ingest. Think about it this way. Um, one of the things that made Kobe Bryant such an incredible basketball player, Michael Jordan, an incredible expert, and now people argue that LeBron James may be the greatest ever. I won't make that argument. I still think it's Jordan, but that's neither here nor there. But what makes LeBron so amazing is his cerebral approach. He thinks about basketball. He's not just out dribbling and cutting and passing and jumping. LeBron is, is a cerebral assassin that literally he studies the game. And because he studied the game, it increases and improves the gift that he has. So I want to encourage you to get this book to, to just make it a part of your library. It'll be when I finish, the, when I get the syllabus to you today, it'll be in the uh, suggested readings that, that you have. And I'll tell you in a few minutes the, the main book that we're going to use, although I think I told you that Monday. But so this the, these definitions, let me give you this, and I'm going to give you some names. In this book, uh, Power in the Pulpit, Volume 1, you have people, and I'm listing some preachers here. Before I give you these definitions, here's some preachers to consider. Just to, just to check out their, they, they, uh, here's some preachers to consider, just to check out their sermon, how they go about doing it. Um, uh, um, what's her name? What's her name? Um, Ralph Douglas West. Dr. Ralph Douglas West. Dr. Ralph West is considered to be, for many years, probably the premier preacher in a generation. I mean, they, they call him the, the godfather now of preaching, especially in the black pulpit. It is, it is amazing uh, how people have studied and imitated and, uh, and invited Dr. Ralph Douglas West. Um, you have in this in this book, Dr. Gardner C. Taylor, who uh, who I just referenced, Dr. Gardner C. Taylor. You have in this book, uh, Dr. Samuel Radcliffe. Um, but you also have in this book, uh, Dr. Carolyn Ann Knight. You'll hear me say something about her as we go along. Um, Dr. Carolyn Ann Knight, you have in this one of my mentors, Dr. Zan Wester Holmes Jr., who I think 
in my humble opinion, should be considered amongst the greatest preachers of a generation. Like Sam Wilson Holmes Jr., there is none like him. And I could go on and on and on, but I want to lift up a couple of names uh, that are that are that are, that they offer some definitions in this book. Here's one, Dr. Charles Adams, Dr. Charles G. Adams. Dr. Charles G. Adams, he says that preaching is, and I'll repeat this so you can write it down, the truth of God delivered through the contingent, feeble, and vulnerable instrumentality of human personality. Let me repeat it. Dr. Charles G. Adams said that preaching is the truth of God delivered through the contingent, feeble, and vulnerable instrumentality of human personality. Contingent, feeble, and vulnerable instrumentality of human personality. So that's Dr. Charles G. Allen. I'll repeat it one more time. The preaching is the truth. It happens when, the, when we declare the truth of God delivered through the contingent, feeble, and vulnerable instrumentality of human personality. Now, of course, Charles Adams is lifting this, shaping this from a definition of a preacher in the 1800s by the name of Phillips Brooks. It's important that you know that name. Phillips Brooks was considered at one time to be kind of the, 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 the trendsetter in regard to preaching and homiletics and hermeneutics and how we go about doing it. Phillips Brooks said, and I offer his definition now. Philip Brooks said that preaching is the proclamation of truth through the median of human personality. You can see immediately the, the influence of Phillips Brooks on Charles Adams' definition. Mm -hmm. That preaching is, as Charles Adams said, the truth of God delivered through the contingent, feeble, and vulnerable instrumentality of human personality. Philip Brooks says it's the, it's the proclamation of truth through the medium of human personality. God takes us individually and God says something through us, but it's, it's, it's how do I say it? It's flavored by our personality. That each and every person has their own uniqueness. And one of the things we try to do through the course of this preaching track is help each of us to develop our own particular approach to preaching. But let me give you another definition offered in this book. There's a preacher also in this book by the name of Dr. H.B. Charles. Actually, H.B. Charles Jr. H.B. Charles Jr. says, preaching explains what the text means by what it says. Make sure you get this. Preaching explains what the text means by what it says. Preaching explains what the text means by what it says. Preaching explains what the text means by what it says. So for Charles, for, for H.B. Charles, preaching has everything to do with, has everything to do with the Bible. Explain the Bible. Let me give you, they're not in, he's not in this book, but there's a preacher of note by the name of Dr. Steve Lawson. Dr. Steve Lawson says, preaching does three things. I just offer it just as an aside. He says, preaching reads the text, he says, explains the text and then applies the text. This is what he says preaching is. Now, let me give you one other definition that's here in this book that I think of somebody I want you to pay note to, Dr. Cheryl Sanders. Dr. Cheryl Sanders says this about preaching. He said, first and foremost, it is a conversation with a crowd. The preaching is a conversation with the crowd that the preacher stands to engage the people in a conversation. She's 
of lifting that from, what's his name? Harry Emerson Fosdick. Harry Emerson Fosdick was a great preacher. Uh, in fact, pastor, I believe, of the Riverside Church in New York, which was a classical church in the history, in the history of Christianity. Um, he used to do something called the, uh, the National Radio uh, Presentation. And uh, Dr. Harris and Emerson Fosdick would say that uh, preaching is group therapy. That is, that, is, that, is, that is literally the preacher standing up as a therapist to deal with the ills of the community, but we do it in a group setting. Our counselor down the hall would appreciate that, I think, because, um, because they do something in her field called group therapy. You know, and, and the whole point is to take one topic and to help everybody, yes, in their own individual way, but in a guided way to deal with that particular uh, issue and to come to prayerfully their own conclusion, their own healing. So Cheryl Sanders said it's a conversation. Now we see this, especially in the black church. There is a there is a call and response in black in the black church, man, where the preacher will say something and the people will respond and and you don't see that in a whole lot of ways. That's not true. We, we're seeing it more and more in non-black setting uh, because you, we, we're seeing, um, especially in the charismatic church, our 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 Caucasian brothers and sisters are adopting and uh, and, uh, and taking on that particular way of going by preaching. But it's a conversation. The the congregation is saying something to us by the verbal response, by the non-verbal response. We're saying something then both verbally and even through our, 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 our gestures, et cetera, there's a conversation going on. And so, and so it's important for us to understand this. Now, having said that, um, you got this. I want to I wanna create some more space just because I don't have, I would love to have a bigger board to where <laughs> I can, um, and I may, I may flip over and use the smart board. I can't do that. I just, I, when I'm talking, I think it helps to actually point out some stuff to write down and I kind of one of my last little bastions of old school that I can, I'm going to hold on to for another minute. But I want to give you my definition of preaching. I, have, I believe it's important how we define preaching because how we define it will ultimately determine how we do it. How we, when we understand what we're here to do, it now will determine how we go about doing it. Thank God to Aries kicking it off. Praise the Lord. All right. So here's my definition. And this is my definition of preaching. This is my working definition. Preaching happens when a person stands up while simultaneously. Sitting down allowing God to stand up in them and say through them what God wants to say. That is my now, now my working definition of preaching. Preaching happens when an individual stands up while simultaneously sitting down, allowing God to stand up in them and say through them what God wants to say. That I think at the, at the, at the beginning, end, and in the middle of preaching, it's all about, as I agree with you, what does God want to say? God has something on God's mind. And what is it that God wants to say to these people? Now, we, the preacher, we become the vessel through which, listen, you are, you're a musician, you're a singer. Um, the trumpet in, and the, the saxophone, they, they are wonderful and beautiful instruments. But if you just hold a trumpet here, it, it does nothing. It has the potential but it only plays to the brilliance of the person who's playing. If the musician that's playing the trumpet, that's blowing the trumpet, does not know how to get the proper airflow, then the notes will not come out properly. If they don't know how to position the fingers and control the valves, then the notes will be distorted. 
it's the it's the it's the musician that plays through the trumpet that plays through the instrument that creates the music god is the musician who now uses us to speak god's word to create i love the i love this i love this this metaphor that preaching i love this metaphor that preaching is music being a singer that ought to, that ought to light your soul on fire because when we're preaching we're making music it's a tune that god plays to create the rhythm of humanity that God now creates a, a, a rhythm, a beat, to a drum, if it were, an orchestra, a, a, a symphony that will now move our lives about. So that's what happens. Preaching happens. When an individual stands up, I said a person, but an individual stands up while simultaneously sitting down, that are allowing God to stand up in them and say through them what God wants to say. Now, let me, let me move one step further. It's 9.37. I've got 13 minutes approximately, or 15 minutes. What is it? 14 minutes? What time is it? I've got about 13 minutes to try to try to do what, a couple other things. Because I'm not sure, I'm not so sure that somebody else don't have to have this classroom. So let me so let me now move forward to say this. Um the aim of preaching, the aim of preaching, and this is important is communication. That when we say we want to preach, we're not just getting up just to, to, to say something to people. We're getting up for the purpose of sharing a message. But we want that message to be received. It's a communication. Um, and it's important for us to understand. I'll just do this because I don't think I have time to do the rest of it. What are some of the elements of preaching? What's involved in it? Go ahead. Uh, telling the story. Yeah, telling the story. Uh, how to uh, use the word of God in a real life situation. So how to uh, how to use the word of God and to apply it to real life. Good. I like it. No, I like it. Uh -huh. uh, to to enact God, God's word and to actually put it to good use. Mm -hmm. I like it. I like it. Let me give you a few that I want you to write down. I like all of that. The first thing that it involves is, and I need to write this just because every time I don't put this up here first, I always get blasted by people. Oh, so you don't think we need to pray? I get that every time. <laughs> so the first thing is it's prayer. Remember, preaching is the proclamation of what God wants to say. So we who will preach if we're going to do it effectively. We, we, have to, we have to have a clear line of connection to say, God, what do you want to say to that? Okay, so the first element is prayer. But here's the second element of, of preaching, and this is really important. That is the word of God. Now, I will say something now that we can take on a little bit later, um, and I won't, and I won't, and I won't, um, I, would look, I would look forward to our conversation about this. When I say the word of God, I mean two things. First of all, I'm talking about the Bible. To be sure, I believe that the primary, and I'm quoting now James Cone, who was a great systematic theologian at a Union Theological Seminary for a long time, just died recently. James Cone said that that that, pre, that, that Bible is the, the primary source of truth for Christians, the primary source of truth, not the only. And this is important for us to understand. Not it is the Bible for its power, for its greatness, for its grandeur. It is the word of God um, to the extent that it contains the word of God. And I know, and I know that this is a little bit different than what we're going to hear in our churches. Because do we hear, and when we talk about the Bible in churches, we're going to hear two terms. We're going to hear terms like infallibility, and we're going to hear terms like inerrancy. And I understand those who would espouse those. I completely agree the, the word of God is infallible. I completely agree that the word of God is in, is in error. I don't agree that the Bible is. I don't believe that the Bible is infallible. Neither do I believe that the Bible is inerrant. Let me prove it. <clears throat> to be inerrant would mean to, literally to be without error. 
Um, there are some historical points that are made in the Bible that when you check them against the historians with some of the kings that sat in power at the time and some of the political movement, it does not line up with some of history, but the Bible was never intended to be a historical book. Mm -hmm. If one goes to the Bible and they decide that they're going to read it to try to determine history, we're losing the, we're losing the spirit and the power of it anyway. But there are also some contradictions in the Bible that we just have to acknowledge and it bugs people, which is why everybody can't sit in these classes because this is not Sunday school. This, this is us learning so that we can then go and create disciples who have a maturity. Here's what happened. In the Bible, for example, um, the Bible says, just regarding the history, the, the resurrection of Jesus, for example, Matthew reports that there were two angels at the tomb. Mark reports that there was one young man. Luke reports that there were two young men, and John doesn't report anybody. Now, when we read the Bible, because we consider, consider it to be such a sacred book spoken from the mouth of God, we don't want to acknowledge that. So, so we therefore said, no, there are no contradictions. But ladies and but gentlemen, I'm sorry, I'm so used to teaching everybody. Here's the reality. We have to recognize this Bible contains some, some cause different authors are writing from different angles. And even Paul, in one place, he said, let the women be silent in the church. And the very chapters in which he writes it, he said, God gives gifts to the body. Women are part of the body. Part of those gifts are speaking gifts. She, they have gifts of tongues. They have gifts of interpretation. They have gifts of prophecy. Those are speaking gifts. How can she be silent in the church if she, if she has these gifts? But the point is that there's the Bible. I got seven minutes now, man. Then, then B, then B, the word of God includes the Bible. And then it also includes, I'm just going to use a fancy term here, the rhema. Rhema is a, is a now word. It's a spoken word. It's, it's what God says right now. Now, um, preaching includes prayer. It includes the word of God. It also includes, and this is important, um, human experience. That when we start talking about preaching, we're talking about human experience. First and foremost, we're talking about the persons in the Bible. So we talk about, we, we, we read the stories with excitement about Moses and Daniel and Ruth and Naomi. We, we read the story of Abraham and Sarah. We read the story of Jacob and Rebecca. We read these stories and we get excited how God delivered people from lions then and cooled fires and tore down walls. We, those are the stories of the people in the Bible. But then there is also an inclusion of the people in the congregation. That's, it's so incredibly important because preaching involves taking what is in the Bible, as you so well said, I thought you did a good job of it, and applying it to the people in the congregation. Here's the thing, right? You might want to write this down. I believe this with my whole heart. If the message does not relate, it won't be received. So if the message doesn't relate, it won't be received. We we have to, we have to preach in such a way that the people can receive it. Um, Acts chapter two, Acts chapter two, they began to speak in tongues. I truly believe that the reason they speak in tongues is to fulfill Acts chapter one, verse eight. You're gonna be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. In, in Jerusalem that day were people from everywhere. They spoke all kinds of languages. So what does God do? Is God gives them the message in a way that it can relate to the people. Because if the message is not, can, does not relate, it will not be received. So there was, there was the human experience, the persons in the Bible, the per, people in the congregation, but then finally, the preacher. We cannot preach devoid our own experience. We bring to the table, we bring to the preaching moment, our own suppositions, our own assumptions, as determined by what we experience. Our skepticism comes out of what we experience. Our faith that flourishes come out of what we experience. So the, these are some of the things. Let me do one final thing. We'll pick this, we'll pick this up when we come back, okay, Monday. Um, and I'll give instructions for what I want you to do. Number four, it involves 
exegesis and interpretation. And we'll just quit with this. Exegesis and interpretation. Exegesis, we'll get into this because I'm going to do, we're going to do a whole session on this. But exegesis, in short, deals with breaking that I'm, I'm being real simple, over simple with this man. Breaking down the text so that we don't give away the, the conversation for later. When we do an exegesis of a passage, we literally are breaking it down. We looking at the words, we're looking at the context, we're looking at the, the characters. We're, we're, we're literally almost like an investigation and we'll get more into that. Interpretation, interpretation really in short deals more with application. In essence, we're saying, what does this have to do with anything? But when we interpret and when we exegete, we are exegeting the passage, the people in the passage, but then we're also exegeting, and this is really important, we're exegeting and interpreting the, the people in the congregation and our world. Carl Barth said that the preacher, and this was years ago, of course, but Carl Barth said that the preachers are the end of the pulpit with a, this was years ago, of course, he said the preacher ought to enter the pulpit with a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in another. Mm -hmm. That we don't preach messages. I have such a problem. I'll get into some of this. But I have such a problem with some of the preaching that I do. Because it's aloof. It's a miss. It is detached from human reality. How dare George Floyd be killed with a knee on his neck? And then the preacher stands up Sunday morning. And so many did it to just talk about the prosperity of God. Really? How dare, how dare, um, where was the shooting in New York? Where the, where, the, where the people are killed, and where was it where the children were shot and killed? I can't remember the name of the, Uvalde. When, 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 they, when they were killed in Uvalde, how dare these elementary age students be shot down and killed and parents now having to bury their loved ones, people struggling to pay trying to decide, do I buy medicine or do I did get gas? How dare we stand up and ignore the ills in the world to preach some aloof message just to make people feel good? No, no. The prophet of Israel, and I've got to quit now, I've got one minute. The prophet of Israel had a charge. And part of that charge was, to go forth and let justice roll down like water, Amos said. Righteousness has a mighty strength. That the, that the prophet of God had the, in fact, let me say it this way. People oftentimes, now especially in the, in the, Hispa, in the uh, ex, not the Hispanic, but in the charismatic community, people want, want prophets. They want prophets. No, not in the Old Testament, not in the Bible. They didn't want a prophet to come. In fact, in, El in Elijah, in 1 Kings chapter 18, um, um, Ahab called Elijah a troublemaker because when the prophet showed up, the prophet oftentimes wasn't coming to tell them how prosperity was coming. The prophet was coming to tell them that God said, if you don't change, destruction is coming. And people didn't want the prophets to come. What I'm trying to do with us now is get us to the place where we will be prophets. Where well, we stand up and we preach the good news in the, in the scripture. But we don't avoid the challenge of God that makes us to be better people. So having said all that, having said all of that, um, having said all of that, and I didn't do a good job of getting this all on camera. So let me see if I can get it so that it so that it at least be uh, seen. Okay. Having said all that, this is what I want. This is what I want you to do for this week. I understand that you have to be out Friday. Thank you for letting me know in advance. I do appreciate that. A um, couple of things going forward. Number one, hopefully I'll have this room a few more minutes. Going forward, here's, what, here's one thing that we need to do. I believe that everything that we do in our religion classes is training for who we are. 
Okay. So first and foremost, you need to purchase the book. Your book is. Make sure I'm calling the title right. I mispronounce this title all the time. I believe it's the 12 essential skills of preaching, but let me make sure. Yeah, it's not the, it's 12. Okay. So there is a book called 12 Essential Skills for, for great preaching. You need to get that book as quickly as possible. You can get it on Kindle or whatever. It's by Wayne McDill. Okay. So you need to make sure that you get that book. We will begin to work through that book. We will begin to uh, to deal with that. We'll be doing it as of as of Monday. Y'all coming in here? Yeah. Okay. No, okay. I'm almost done. I promise I'm almost done. Okay. So 12 essential skills for great preaching. Number two, you need to make sure that when you come to class, dress. What I'm saying is appropriate. It doesn't mean that you're inappropriately dressed. It just simply means as preachers, there's a uniform. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want you, to, I want us to practice. So it's a, it's a good practice. I know that people have changed in this day and they don't, you know, people dress a little different for church, but I believe the doctors go to the, to the hospital and they still wear their uniform. They don't wear their coat. I believe preachers still are dressed like preachers. So make sure you do that. You know, I will not require you to put on a tie, but I will actually put on uh, what we would call business casual, a shirt, dress shirt, slacks, shoes, okay? Number three, you need to preach and record a sermon. I'm not, I did not go today into what, how far you, what, what, what we do when we prepare. I want to see what you're going to do. It needs to be 15 to 20 minutes, no more. Yeah, you need to record it. What I would encourage you to do is you can record it in Zoom if you want to. And then upload it uh, to YouTube, or you record it directly. However, but it needs to be a YouTube video. There's a prop that you know got a link to where I can open it up. You're gonna up, you're gonna send that. You're gonna upload that. I'm gonna I'm gonna create put it out there. You're gonna upload it on Canvas. Okay. It'll be due by Sunday by Saturday evening or so. Okay. All right. Are there any questions? No sir. All right. Okay. Well, if, if there be nothing else, the Lord be with you. We'll see you. We'll see you on Monday.